And now we resume Synod Central here in the final week of the Synod on Synodality Part 1. Sounds like a franchise. Uh, this is the most complete coverage you're going to get of the Synod anywhere. I'm joined by half of the papal posse, Father Gerald Murray, canon lawyer, priest of the Archdiocese of New York. Father, I, I, I want to welcome you to our priestly panel on the Synod on Synodality. I know there's only one of us who are, is an ordained priest, but look, if lay people can now vote at a Synod on Bishops, surely a layman can be part of the priestly panel. I guess we're all part of the <laughs> royal priesthood, right? Uh, well, we'll start right in, Father. The Synod just released a letter to the people of God, essentially a letter to itself, since they're not all bishops, as we mentioned a moment ago. Uh, it was voted on by a round of applause a nice way of avoiding particulars like who voted for what and how many. Between now and the Synod Part 2, they write this, to progress in its discernment, the Church absolutely needs to listen to everyone, starting with the poorest. It means listening to those who have been denied the right to speak in society or who feel excluded, even by the Church, listening to people who are victims of racism in all its forms. Now, Father, I have to say, given the marginalization of traditional people in the church, this is a hard one to swallow. I agree, Raymond. In fact, this just continues what the whole synodal process has been doing, which is uh, giving legitimacy to a bunch of grievances that the church is excluding people. Uh, and people feel excluded, not because they've chosen to do things against the church, but rather the church is doing something against them. Uh, not a good way to uh, address the people of God. And I agree with you, as you said earlier, that this is a little bit strange because a synod does not exist apart from the pope. A synod is meant to be an assembly of bishops that advises the pope. So they don't have an independent mm -hmm. existence uh, to go and issue documents. It's happened before, so it's not something new. It happened in 2012. But again, it's a strange way of acting. If the synod is representative of the people of God, and that's been what we've been told the whole time through, why is it now that they're suddenly turning to us rather than saying, Holy Father, this is what we'd like you to tell the people of God? Right. No, no, it's, it's, it's like a, a cyclical letter. You know, it's a letter to me. Uh, Father, there's another paragraph in this synod letter, which frankly brought tears of horror and laughter to my eyes simultaneously. Just days ago, the Diocese of Koper in Slovenia has confirmed that disgraced Jesuit priest Father Marko Rupnik, that mosaic artist, who was expelled from the Jesuit order, excommunicated due to credible allegations of spiritual and sexual abuse of nuns, has been accepted in that diocese as a priest. So he's working again. He's back in a diocese. At the same time, the Synod writes this, and I want you to react. Above all, the church of our time has the duty to listen in a spirit of conversion to those who have been victims of abuse committed by members of the ecclesial body and to commit herself concretely and structurally to ensure that this does not happen again. Father, nobody at the Vatican gives a damn about these victims, frankly, or Rubnik would not have been resurrected. Your reaction to this? Why is he being protected? Uh, why is he being protected? That I can't answer. What I can say is that this is the most disgraceful thing to happen, particularly now when the Synod comes out with what you just read, saying that the voices of victims need to be listened to and victims have to be taken care of. Let's recall some facts about Father Rupnik. Father Rupnik was accused very credibly by multiple sisters, uh, religious women that he was spiritual director to, to forcing himself upon them sexually, to engaging in perverted practices. And then he was accused of having forgiven in confession one of the people that he committed sex acts with. For that, he was found mm -hmm. guilty by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. That was why he was excommunicated. And then beyond reason, of course, this was never known at the time, but we found out subsequently when it was leaked, but within a couple of weeks of him being excommunicated, the penalty was lifted. There's no evidence that he ever admitted to the crime that he had committed and showed due repentance. In canon law, you can't have a penalty remitted unless you show repentance. He's never repented. He's continued to claim that he did nothing. Now, as regards what happened, aside from the excommunication for the confessional abuse, he should have been prosecuted for taking advantage of vulnerable adults. Can you imagine a young sister mm -hmm. who's listening to the spiritual director? He committed these crimes. The Holy See investigated it. The Jesuits investigated it. 
The word was that he should be prosecuted, but since these crimes fell outside a statute of limitations, according to canon law, nothing happened. All the while, we know that Pope Francis and his department have lifted statutes of, of limitation right. when the case merited it. And this should have happened here. So what happens? The Jesuits then do a further investigation to see whether or not he should be thrown out of the order. He will not cooperate. He did not cooperate with the investigation, so they did throw him out. Mm. But he continues now to be a priest in good standing. This is absolutely disgraceful. I'd like to, Raymond, this is a great question. Why weren't Rupnik's yeah. victims allowed to address the synod body? I would believe right. the, the words of that letter. It, his victims were given a hearing at the synod so that, of course, the ecclesiastics in the Vatican who are going along with this whitewash would be exposed for what's going on. This is disgraceful. I can't believe that this yeah. is happening, but I, unfortunately, I do believe it because it did happen. Well, but, but Father, what's so hypocritical about it? And look, I had friends in the secular world, non-Catholics call me when this story broke, and they said, wait a minute, didn't your church, meaning Pope Francis in a piece of legislation recently, didn't he say there was zero tolerance for this behavior and even those who attempt to cover it up or hide it, that they should be removed from, from their office. I mean, isn't that what the new law says? Yes, the, uh, the, the law that Pope Francis instituted covers not only the crime of sexual abuse of minors and then what's called vulnerable adults, it also covers covering up these sins uh, and these crimes. Now, the real question here is, why in the world was Rupnik so quickly pardoned for his excommunication, and why wasn't he further prosecuted? He's being protected. This, this is go let's go back to the Macara case. An mm -hmm. influential churchman is given preference, and until it's exposed by leaks, remember, the reason McCarrick ended up being thrown out of the priesthood is one of his victims went to the New York Times and complained about it. Yeah. You know, this is what's happening in this world. The church is only purified when outsiders come in and reveal behind the curtain that we've got a bunch of corrupt people acting to protect their friends. This is terrible. This needs to change. Rupnik should be removed from that diocese, prosecuted. And I encourage the victims now, go to civil court, take this man to court, you know, sue the diocese. Uh, that's accepting him because they're risking the, the lives of those people. Is he going to go to a parish yeah. and now start giving spiritual direction again? I'd like to know that. Yeah, well, this is, it's absurd to say, well, we have to listen to everybody. No, don't listen. Take action. Your job is to take action and protect the flock from these wolves running wild. And that's what this seems to my eye, at least. Father, we've got to get back to this synod. There's another line in this letter from the Synod Assembly that confirms what we have said from the start. Remember, early on, we said this was never about shiny objects of this hot button topic or that. It was always about hijacking and rejiggering the decision-making process of the church. Here's the quote from the Synod. She, the church, needs to welcome the voice of those who want to be involved in lay ministries and to participate in discernment and decision-making structures. Father, what is happening here? The decision-making structure in the church, this is not the way the church describes herself. This is, we're not corporate America. You know, we're not a multinational corporation, you know, with a board of governors and, and electing people to be chairman. Uh, the governing structure of the church is the divine constitution given by Christ. It's a hierarchical church founded upon Peter and the apostles, their successors, the popes and bishops, and then those who cooperate with them, the priests and the deacons, in uh, the sacrament of holy orders. Holy orders is integral to governance in the church. Now, decision-making can be influenced, and it's very wise to get advice from lay people and experts and ordinary people. You know, I trust my local parishioner more than I do some of the theologians when it comes to what is the meaning of the Catholic Church and its, and its faith. But here, this is using an insidious language of decision-making processes as if we're going to bind bishops now to have lay approval for their decisions. By the way, that's what the German synodal way wants. Uh, I hope that's right. not where this is going. Yeah. Well, look, I think most people watching this, Father, most Catholics, they can't figure out what the heck is even happening. And part of that is the tortured language. This word synod, I want to dive into this. It's now being used as a verb, an adjective, a noun. It's everything and nothing simultaneously. Here's a little montage of what I mean. Listen.
culture of listening, culture of synodality, culture of inclusion. Learning to be a synodal church, to learn how to be synodal, being a synodal person in a synodal church. And the point about this synod, and the other thing that makes it different, is that it is actually about synodality. The truth is that synod has always been what the church has done. So, Father, they've taken a real word, synod, meaning a gathering of bishops, only bishops, and stretched it with the same maddening innovation that they seek to impose on the church now. But if we don't have clarity, we're beginning to see the many faces of this synodality from the participants themselves. Father Vimal Tirimana, he's a Sri Lankan moral theologian. He spoke at the Vatican this week about how some issues like women's ordination and same-sex blessings need a synodal mindset and lifestyle. Listen. I can assure you, once the firm foundation of the synodal life is laid, I repeat, once the firm foundation of the synodal way of life is laid, those things can be built up on that. In that sense, the most important thing is not to address whether a woman can be ordained, whether LGBTQ should be accepted, whether gay marriage should be blessed. Not that they are not important. So first we lay the foundation, the foundation of the synodal way, a synodal culture, a listening culture, a culture that includes, automatically these issues are bound to come sooner, if not later. They're bound to come sooner, if not later, Father. I've, I said it the first week, this is about changing the governance of the church. What is the foundation of a synodal way of living? Uh, uh, what, what does this mean, Father? Uh, well, I can say he's using double talk and he's speaking in circles. Uh, he talks about everyone's interest being part of the foundation of a synodal approach to life. Uh, this is ridiculous. The Catholic Church is founded on the rock. Jesus Christ founded it on, on the faith. The faith of the Catholic Church is founded upon the confession of St. Peter, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. We say that, and that's why we listen to the Pope and the bishops, because they repeat that teaching. And then Christ had a lot of other things to say which we believe in. The idea that we, we get accustomed to something, we don't even know what it is, a synodal way of life, and then somehow the issue of, as he said, blessing gay marriage will resolve itself. Or the yes. ordination of women will resolve itself. Uh, no, you're right. This is about restructuring the church in such a way that the bishops no longer uphold the faith. They simply answer the phone and say, well, what did the majority of people ask for? Do they want women priests? Uh oh, I guess we got to have women priests. This is ridiculous. This is a, a, a real threat to the life of the church. Why are we having theologians who talk this double talk at a synod to tell us that the things that the church cannot do because they contradict the gospel are suddenly on the agenda? Yeah, no, it, it's so bizarre. At the same time, Father, you and I just read this. There's a new book that was just published this week, an interview with Pope Francis, and in it he says very clearly women's ordination, women as female deacons, it's, it's inadmissible. You can't do it. So why are we having this entire exercise, and why are people sitting there in a meditative state discerning whether or not you can ordain women in, in small groups and large groups? None of this makes sense to me. Very quickly. You're, no, no, you're right. And actually, the, the fact that these issues, as they're called issues, they're really contradictions of the gospel, the fact that they were included on the synodal working document and became part of the agenda shows the whole reason why this synod has turned out to be a disaster. We do not sit around a table, talk about things that can't come into being, but that's what they've been asked to do. Uh, the Pope's, what he yeah. said in that book, and I'm looking forward to reading the whole thing, it's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. You cannot ordain a woman a priest. You cannot. So why would you make somebody have false expectations and say, we're going to talk about the inclusion of women in all the ministries of the church? That's in the synodal working document. It should never have been there. Yeah, and the, the amazing thing is the Pope even says in that book, and, and I don't have it in front of me, but I remember reading a quote, he says, the Lutherans, they ordained women, and they didn't get any extra people in the pews. Just the opposite. So it, very interesting that we, you know, we have the, this kind of uh, double approach where he's saying this in the book, but the synod that he's leading is saying something very different. 
or moving in a different direction. Anyway, at the same Vatican press briefing we just played you, we were introduced to yet another face of Synod, Sister Patricia Murray. I don't think she's any relation, Father, the executive secretary of the International Union of Superiors General. She agreed that though revelation and tradition are basic to these synodal discussions, learning to be a synodal person is also key. One of the key aspects of being a synodal person in a synodal church is to learn to have freedom. I, yes, I have my own uh, inclinations and things I would like to see happening. But if I'm really and truly entering into the synodal process, I, I leave those aside. I pray for freedom. I pray for the grace to be truly open to what my brother and sister are sharing and saying. I pray to God's spirit to give me the, the enlightenment and the, the insight into where we're being drawn as a body, as this communion of people. Father, I have a question. How synodal have you been today, and are you becoming a synodal person, the one you were meant to be? <clears throat> I'll let others judge that, Raymond, but the, the point here, again, is more double talk. I, yeah, I mean, what is I this? I have, this. I have, yeah, I have inclinations that I'm going to leave aside. Does she mean the, the fact that she prays every day, goes to communion, goes to confession, talks the, to the gospel, talks about the gospel to children and adults? I don't want to leave any of that aside. I think what we know what she means is, uh, you know, women's ordination, acceptance of homosexual lifestyle, things like that, which are being pushed all the time. And she's waiting to see, well, let's see if anybody else agrees with that idea. Then if they do, then we'll all get together and say this is the will of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. This is double. This is mm -hmm. manipulative. This is this, you know, uh, conscientization of the people and, you know, group therapy sessions in which everybody kind of says, well, where are we going as a group? Because then I'll know what to do as an individual. Now, you know where we need to go? Back to the four Gospels, read what Jesus said, and then start reading the classic uh, teachings of the church. Then we'll understand wasting time on issues that are against Catholicism is not the way to spend a synod. Yeah, but Father, I, I want to I want to call your attention and the audience's attention to something Sister Murray said there. And this is the woman who represents religious, you know, all, all over the place. Mm -hmm. Global. She's she's head of a global uh, a union, if you will. Notice the talk of quote being trained in the synodal process. How long, Father, before we have synodal trainers and seminars in dioceses? And what do you think is meant by a synodal person? Um, I have no real idea because if you look, if you go to the dictionary, you're not going to find those two words together with a, with a coherent <laughs> definition. A synodal person, I mean, this is this whole notion that we've been hearing that the church is constitutively or constitutionally sy synodal or synodal. Uh, now, wait a minute. The church is a hierarchy. The hierarchy chooses when necessary to meet together to discuss the good of the church. The pastors not the flock, are the ones who direct the flock. So w this meeting, mm -hmm. by the way, it's called the Synod of Bishops. As you, if you look at the list of documents on the website, it's called Synod of Bishops. It's not a Synod of right. Bishops. It's a Synod of Bishops and non-bishops. So it really fails yeah. well, the this... test of what a synod is. So therefore, synodal, can that mean anything that's just changing tomorrow and the day after? Apparently, yes. Yeah. Well, you, you make a great segue there. Cardinal Christoph Schonborn was asked on Monday at the Synodal press briefing, just what you raised. Watch. We, we have heard the, the integrity of the Synod Assembly questioned by some because the Synod includes lay members as delegates. I, I, can't, see, I can't see the problem. Uh, it, is, it remains uh, an Episcopal Synod with real participation of non-bishops. We are all together in synod, in an episcopal synod with an enlarged participation. Father Jerry, is there any evidence to support what His Eminence is saying here? And does that really apply to, say, marriage, the more the merrier? I mean, I would argue adding parties is a distortion to the nature in both cases. 
Yeah, his final words, there were, this is an Episcopal synod, but he just said it's been expanded to include people who aren't bishops. So it can't be a synod of bishops if non-bishops have an equal vote. You know, I would challenge him. I would say he's part of the Episcopal Conference of Austria. At the next meeting of the Episcopal Conference of Austria, maybe they should invite five or six lay people and give them an equal vote in determining the things that the bishops in Austria are going to vote on. Would he ever admit that? Would he say that's the nature of the church? In fact, yeah, five lay people should have equal rights to any bishop in Austria to determine what happens in that country. No, this is more double talk. This is, he himself mm. refers to the earlier participation, which is laudable, of lay experts. I'm right. all in favor of the smartest, smartest people in the room getting the microphone. You know, that's one of the strengths of the Catholic Church. The, some of the best theologians and canon lawyers and philosophers are all lay people. I want to hear from them. But guess what? I don't pretend they're a bishop and that they can vote uh, with bishops to determine uh, what's being done in the life of the church. It's an adulteration of, the, of, of an Episcopal assembly to invite non-bishops and call them, you know, functionally equal to bishops because that's what they are. This is a big mess. This should never have happened. It's, Pope Paul VI never had this in mind. Uh, this had nothing to do mm. with the Vatican, Second Vatican Council. This is an innovation that has eviscerated the nature of the synod. And that, that's, that has to be recognized. Yeah. We, if we don't speak the truth, then we're in the dream world that we make up reality. We're not in a dream world. We're in the real world. Yeah, well, it, it and it is a radical, radical renovation of the decision making process in the Catholic Church, not the Anglican Church or the Eastern Church, which has, which has gone down this sad and ruinous path, but the Catholic Church. Speaking of Cardinal Schornborn, who was the prime mover, we should say, behind the catechism of the Catholic Church under John Paul II, when asked a question about amending the catechism regarding homosexuality, LGBTQ issues, the cardinal cited the change that Francis made to the catechism regarding the death penalty. Father Jerry, is that precedent at the same level as what's being asked here? Well, the question is, Cardinal Schoenberg was asked, can the Catholic Church change its teaching that homosexual inclination is intrinsically disordered? And Father James Martin has written that he wants that stricken from the catechism. He wants it to say it's differently ordered. Schoenborn, Cardinal Schoenborn has said that can be changed. And quite frankly, the Pope did not have the right to change the teaching on the death penalty. He changed the words in the catechism. Pope Benedict was quite clear in St. John Paul II, it is not intrinsically immoral for a state for just cause to use, have recourse and use the death penalty. That doesn't mean they have to, but they can if they need to, and it's properly administered. Pope Francis thinks, it's, he calls it inadmissible, it can't be used. I think he's made a mistake there. That contradicts the entire history of the church, contradicts the Old Testament, it contradicts natural law. Uh, if the death penalty is immoral, then we ha we're going to have to strike large parts of the Old Testament where God commanded the death penalty for certain crimes for the people of Israel. So, yeah, what we're having here is, unfortunately, this has become just like a modern democracy. Uh, we have what's called current policy, and then when a new government comes in, oh, what's the new current policy? That's not how it works with wow. Catholic teaching. So. They cannot change, you cannot make homosexual acts moral by changing the words in the catechism. This is a big problem if they try to do that. Now, well, I, you know, I've referred to this whole notion that you can kind of go in and uh, change the catechism here, change the catechism there. Th this is the silly putty version of Catholicism. People come to the church because of its eternal teaching that is true through time. Does one distortion of church teaching here, Father, in this case the death penalty, justify another and another and another? Very quickly. No, it doesn't. And of course, by the way, the catechism is a summary of 2,000 years of teaching. So the idea that if we change the catechism, we've, we've erased the tape on history, that's a naive modern notion. Uh, this is taught forever because it's true. Eternal truth is not subject to man's uh, wishes. And that's a whole philosophical fight that's going on right now in the modern right. world. The Catholic Church cannot cave into what is essentially called historicism, which means what's true in the past is only true now if we agree with it now. No, what was true in the mm. past is true now. That's, that's what the Church teaches about divine revelation and the natural law. Father, the prefect of the Vatican's doctrinal office, Cardinal Fernandez, was asked his thoughts on same-sex blessings, and Fernandez once again asserted that blessings can be given so long as they aren't confused with matrimony. They can be given to, quote, 
every people in every situation, end quote. Fernandez also says blessings are pastoral work, and we don't need to know anything about those that come forward to be blessed. Father Jerry, your thoughts on this, and reflect on this given what the Pope has already said. Well, let's, a couple of things here. Uh, the Pope, in the response to the doobie of the Cardinal Burke and Cardinal Sarah and the others sent in, he said that pastors should look for ways to administer blessings to person and persons that are not going to be confused with uh, blessing of a marriage. So it's the same exact thing that Fernandez is saying. This is wrong. Why is it wrong? The, the problem here is not that people are going to think it's a marriage. The Catholic Church never teaches that two men can marry each other. The problem is that people think the Catholic Church approves of homosexual sexual activity. In other words, that sodomy is no longer a mortal sin. The Church can never say that. This is part of divine revelation and the natural law. Now, you know, Fernandez also says, we need to know nothing about a person who comes to ask a blessing. What, is, what world does he live in? You know, do people who murder people get away with it? Should we then just, you know, have them come into church and get a blessing so they can parade to people that the church thinks they're fine? You know, this is the big problem. We address this during the Nazi period when the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. unfortunately, in some cases, was going along with the Nazi program. Other bishops objected. Uh, and, you know, what a spectacle when you, you bring in uh, Nazis or communists into a church and then we bless them. It, everybody understands what we're doing. We're caving in to the evil dictators because we want either protection or we happen to agree with them. The Catholic Church doesn't agree with Nazism or communism. Uh, no, this is wrong. Yeah, no, no, this, this sounds like the don't ask, don't tell approach to blessings. And I, I, I've never seen that in the church in, in my time. Anyway, uh, Father, just days ago, the Pope <clears throat> met privately with a large contingent of LGBT outreach groups. And last week, he spent an hour with Sister Janine Gramick. She is the founder of a, a gay group, New Ways Ministry. Uh, she was condemned by her own bishops and, and by <laughs> several popes before this one. Uh, here she is speaking to the National Catholic Reporter. We need to get back to the spirit of Vatican II. The council was about the church in the modern world. And for too long, we have been having that fortress mentality of going backward. I know one of the dubia cardinals, Cardinal Muller, gave an interview with EWTN. And I read that interview and I thought, well, that was very good. I think he said nothing that was against Pope Francis. I think he's beginning to listen. And we need to listen to those people for whom the old church was very important. <laughs> the old church, Father Jerry, was very important. Uh, Sister Gramic uh, spoke of, of much more, but I want your reaction to what you heard there. Uh, this idea that it's a big listening session and that those in the old church, we should sort of give them a listen to. <clears throat> well, sisters' powers of listening never were used to accept the rebuke and the canonical punishment she was given by both the American bishops and by the Holy See. She was told not to engage in her apostolate with homosexual people because she was misleading them. Her teaching was, in fact, contradictory to Catholic faith. Uh, Sister Gramic is actually engaged in a disgraceful pursuit to normalize the homosexual lifestyle. And what does that mean to normalize the homosexual lifestyle? It means what I said earlier, to say that sodomy is no longer a sin, that sodomy is somehow as good as natural sexual intercourse. This is the goal here, to have homosexuality as a practice accepted in the life of the church. Uh, now, the regrettable thing, in, in my opinion, is that when Pope Francis meets with these groups that promote the homosexual lifestyle, none of them come back and say to us, you know, the Holy Father told us we shouldn't be doing this. In fact, they come back and just say the Holy Father told us that, we're, you know, we're doing an important work, we're doing something good. I've worked for years since I was a young priest with courage. I haven't seen the courage leadership being called to Rome and invited to come in to speak with Pope Francis and explain to, to them what authentic love means. Because let's get, let's get this point quite clear. When people practice a homosexual lifestyle and want to justify it, say the church doesn't love them, they're wrong. The church loves them by giving them God's truth. 
And I've heard plenty of confessions. I've given counseling to people. When you live a perverted lifestyle in which sexual uh, immorality is the center of your existence, you're on the wrong path and you're a very unhappy person. So you need to repent and change. This isn't Father Murray's opinion. This is the teaching of the church and it's the pastoral wisdom of the church. So why in the world do people who think Catholic teaching is wrong suddenly get all these entrees uh, in the Holy See and yet, you know, the people who accept the teaching are treated, as we say, heard so often, backwardists, nostalgics, people who are, as she said, the old church. What is she talking about? The church is Christ. It's the mystical body. It's ever young, ever new. The teaching of the church is not on a shelf gathering dust. It's in the heart and minds of believers. It's as powerful as the word of Christ was when he uttered it uh, as he walked the face of the earth. This, is, this sister is yeah. very wrong and she's misleading people. Uh, you heard her talk about the wanting to revive the spirit of Vatican II. The truth is, she's the old church. This is like 1972 a flashback. You know, that's the old church. The new church are the young people at church. Talk to them. You'll find they're going to Latin masses. They're very devout. They have families. Very different approach. Anyway, Father, in an effort to create more synodal people and spread synod, the synod in the most synod diddly scrumptious way, America Magazine's Father Tom Reese wrote a column this week writing, quote, Catholics must experience the synod, must do synod. The best place to do this is your parish. Each parish in America can have its own synodal experience by adapting the synodal approach as described in the methodology for the working groups. So, Father, what he's advocating is an at-home edition of the synod. That's right. You can do synod wherever you are. Uh, is this where we're headed? Kind of tendential topics with a hat tip to prayer and then acceptance by applause on the parish level. Well, you know, <laughs> this is a problem. I'm, it's, it's nice that the subject of parish priest comes up because uh, Father Scott Newman, who's a parish priest here in South Carolina, he wrote an article online today in which he said, it's very sad that there are no parish priests involved in the synod, that, as far as we know. We've heard, you know, who's representing parish priests uh, in the synodal gathering? Uh, parish priests are the most important contact that most Catholics have uh, with the church. And, you know, the last thing that a parish priest needs is, a, is an undefined methodology in which people come together, express grievances, and accuse the church of not loving them. And then he has to sit there and say, well, you know what? Uh, I don't know what to do because it's, I'm not a shepherd of the church. I'm not the one authentically teaching. But what I am doing is I'm telling you the teaching of the church I learned in the seminary and that I was inspired when I read the mm -hmm. catechism to teach you. And I can't accept your complaints. So we're, we're devolving into this, what we would basically say is this never-ending therapy session in which the church is accused of being unca uncaring and unmotherly until she, until she basically says to all those crying to her with their complaints, okay, don't worry, we'll figure it out. No, that, that's not Catholicism. Mm. Yeah, well, it, you know, it's, a, it's almost like a Ouija experience without the board, though you might be very bored when it's over. Uh, before we go on, Father, and I, I'm going to have to leave it here, the Synod has accepted amendments to that final report for this phase. They call it a synthesis document, the final summary document. It's expected to be reviewed Saturday on October 28th. Uh, Father, given all we've seen thus far, what do you expect to see in this summary, and what does it mean? Where does it leave us? Well, of course, it's dangerous to predict, and uh, things are not, have not been very publicly identified so far. What I'm afraid, though, is that the tone of the document will reflect the tone of the working document, the, the, the thing they use to, to base these discussions, which is basically church teaching practice and tradition is under a microscope, if not in the dock, and accused of failing to appeal to modern man, because not because modern man is obtuse or is asking for things he shouldn't have, but rather because the teaching of the church is inadequate, the practices are outdated, the traditions, of course, are better left in the past. Uh, if that's what comes out, then we're going to have a year of grief, uh, because we're going to have people telling us, 
The voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through the synodal assembly is telling us we have a brave new church in which everything that people don't like is reexamined and reshaped. You used to use the, the silly putty image. You know, is Catholicism like a, like a ball of wax and we heat it up and roll it around and figure out what we're going to do with it? No, Catholicism <laughs> is Christ. You know, where is Jesus Christ as the center of our efforts here? Did Jesus Christ come down and say, fellas, let's just walk around and see what we come up with? No. He sat people down and he said, you know, I have the words of eternal life. And then he taught us, you know, the Ten yeah. Commandments, you know, the Beatitudes. People wanted to hear for the word of God. They didn't care what the neighbor's anguish was when the presence of God is there in front of them telling them the truth. You want to have your anguishes taken care of? Listen to Jesus. So let's, Raymond, we'll have plenty of time to talk about this over the next year. But if, it, if it's one of yeah. these accusatory documents, then we're in trouble. Yeah. Well, I, I, again, it's the ultimate cliffhanger because nothing happens. You've had a month of activity, uh, you know, that's been behind closed doors with little press reports and these press briefings, so-called briefings. Uh, and, and now this is held over till next October when presumably things will crystallize and then the Pope will make some decision. But who really knows, Father? It's all synodal. So we will, in our synodal way, move on here. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Uh, for commentary from Father Jerry Murray, you can go to thecatholicthing.org. Thank you, Father. Thank you.